The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter, beginning with the 16th verse. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. My sermon text for this Holy Trinity Sunday is the Gospel lesson, Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. My sermon title for this morning is Daring Greatly. Daring Greatly. Today is the only day on our liturgical calendar, that is our church year calendar, which is named after and on which we celebrate a doctrine of the Christian faith, as opposed to an event in the life of Jesus or the church. The earliest and most important and fundamental doctrine of our Christian faith is the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, namely the belief that there is only one God acting in three different persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creating, redeeming, and sanctifying us and all of life. It is this fundamental understanding of God with which the early Christian church grappled during its first 500 years of existence and which produced the three great ecumenical creeds, or statements of faith, the Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian creeds. Needless to say, the centrality and necessity of this doctrine, this understanding of God, is equaled perhaps only by its complexity and mystery. It was that great... North African church father, St. Augustine, who once remarked that to deny the Trinity is to risk losing your soul, but to try to understand the Trinity is to risk losing your mind. (laughs) First, we must acknowledge that the word Trinity is found nowhere in Scripture. Likewise, the doctrine itself is nowhere explained or expounded upon therein. However, having said that, there are several references to such a belief found in Scripture upon which later Christians, theologians, and church councils would construct this doctrine. A few of them actually occur in our readings for today. In the opening verses of Genesis, you see references to God, presumably the Father, His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and His Word, which John later identifies in the flesh as Jesus. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the waters. Then God said, with His word, let there be light. Shortly thereafter, in the creation of humanity, as you heard, the one God uses plural pronouns. Let us make humanity in our image after our likeness. The so-called apostolic greeting, which is used in our liturgy and worship, comes actually from St. Paul's final benediction at the end of 2 Corinthians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And of course, Jesus' final words in Matthew's Gospel this morning command baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We should also note before moving on the rather high view of humankind implicit in such a doctrine or belief. In Genesis, God clearly says, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, he created them. 
The psalmist asks rhetorically in Psalm 8 this morning, What are human beings that you are mindful of them, O God, and mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. So despite the so-called fall of man, which occurs with the original sin of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, and for which we will need Christ's subsequent redemption, never forget that we as human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, you and I are created a little lower than God and are crowned with glory and honor. The doctrine of the Trinity is, of course, fundamentally about God. But it also has powerful, transformative implications for us, his children, as well, since we are created in that very image. This powerful gospel text this morning is Jesus' final words of exhortation and encouragement to his disciples in Matthew's gospel. It is, in fact, unique to Matthew's gospel and is famously known as the Great Commission. Since Jesus is obviously here, giving his disciples a charge and a mission. Verses 19 and 20 herein are important enough to be committed to memory by every Christian. Just as we know the great commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Just as we know the golden rule from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We should also know what our great commission is. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Notice herein the method of making disciples is twofold, namely baptizing and teaching. Baptism, as you know, is done with water, In the name of the Trinity and signifies the forgiveness of sins, rebirth and eternal life as a child of God. Teaching is simply handing on to others the word of God, the scriptures, the teachings of Jesus and the fundamental beliefs of our Christian faith. Since you cannot teach or hand on that with which you are unfamiliar, it is incumbent upon us all. To be lifelong students of Jesus and his words. To always be learning and never be complacent. Should you find such a task daunting, the good news in this great commission lies in the surrounding comfort and promise which bookend these instructions and this task. Verse 18, you see, begins with Jesus saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. While verse 20 concludes with him saying, And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So as you do your best to be a disciple yourself, and to make disciples of others, handing on and down our beliefs about Jesus and his teachings, know that the authority and the power are not yours, but his. He doesn't just possess some authority, but what does the text say? All authority. The one who commissions you in whose name you go forth doesn't wield authority in either heaven or earth, but in and on both. And he has promised to be with you, not sometimes, not occasionally, not every now and then, or when time permits, or only in good times, or only in bad times, but rather always, even till the end of this age. As it concerns this great commission, the task or duty to which Jesus has called us until he returns, I would like to call your attention to a quote which I hope you will find instructive and compelling. The quote is from President Teddy Roosevelt at the turn of the last century. It is not the critic who counts, he said. Not the person who points out how the strong person stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the person who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement 
and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. It is not incumbent upon you to be successful, my friends. But God does desire that you be faithful and that you dare greatly. Dare greatly to love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. To do unto others as you would have them do unto you. To worship God in spirit and in truth. Dare greatly to come to a greater knowledge of and intimacy with a God who possesses all authority, who sends you out and forth to make disciples of all nations and who promises to be with you always. Dare greatly, my friends, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. To feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger and outcast, visit the sick and imprisoned, care for orphans and widows, and do unto the least of these among us as you would do unto Christ himself. Let it be said of St. Philip Lutheran Church that we dare greatly to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, to manifest the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. To proclaim that we are saved by grace through faith and not by our works. And to live into the reality that there is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let it be said of us that we dare greatly to cleanse the leper, heal the sick, exercise the demon possessed, raise the dead, preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, and do even greater works than these about which Jesus spoke. When it comes to outreach, evangelism, stewardship, and generosity, let us dare greatly, my friends. When it comes to turning the other cheek, praying for our enemies, and blessing those who curse us, let us dare greatly. When it comes to beating our swords into plowshares or spears into pruning hooks, refusing to lift up sword or study war anymore. When it comes to weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice, let us dare greatly. And know that the reason we can dare greatly is because we have a God who dared greatly for us. And what is the Holy Trinity if not God daring greatly? What is God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, deciding to come down to earth in God the Son, wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger, taking on the form of a servant, being tortured, tortured, executed on a cross, taken down and buried, if not God, daring greatly. What is God the Son, Jesus Christ, rising from the grave on the third day, appearing openly to His disciples, ascending into heaven, and giving His Holy Spirit and tongues of fire on Pentecost to His disciples, if not God, daring greatly. When God gave water from the rock, manna and quail from heaven, when God gave His people a land flowing with milk and honey, when he saved Daniel from the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace, and you from the worst repercussions of whatever it is you're going through right now. What is all of that if not God daring greatly? As God is remaining faithful and true to all of his promises to you right now. As he is extending to you love and acceptance and reconciliation and forgiveness and embrace. What is he doing on your behalf if not daring greatly? Who is the person who is actually in the arena? Whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood? Who strives valiantly? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who dies daring greatly? Who is resurrected daring greatly if not Jesus the Christ? On this Holy Trinity Sunday, know that there is only one God, that He exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that He creates you in His own divine image and likeness, redeems you by His own precious blood, and sustains and sanctifies you by His own indwelling Holy Spirit, and that He eternally dares greatly for you, for me, and for all of His creation. And he then calls us to, 
and equips us for and commissions us to go out and dare greatly for his kingdom here on earth. Daring greatly. Daring greatly. Amen.